before we get to spraying this stuff, we need to talk about it a little bit. Now, this is one of those places where it can get really confusing. And the problem is, is that me sitting here telling you about it or doing a whole bunch of charts isn't going to help a lot. This is where the books do help, where they can, in the written word, lay it out, spell it out, and, com and show you. The best thing you can do is to go look at whatever product you're using. Get the specs on it, if they're not on the can, get your material safety data sheets. Uh, most of them you can look up online and understand about the different finishes. Now, and what am I talking about? Well, you know, in solvent base, for example, we have vinyl sealers. Now, these are, these are what's typically called a sanding sealer. And you're going to see sanding sealers, and then in this case, case here's a water white vinyl sealer. What's the difference? Sanding sealers are basically a finish that has sterates added to it to make it easy to sand. It's typically the first thing that goes on to help seal down and get a nice smooth surface. Vinyl sealers, vinyl's tough as it gets. Vinyl's typically used in high moisture areas and whatever, has an excellent adhesion and it lays down a really tough barrier. It's used a lot in the kitchen cabinet industry and bathrooms and whatever. Uh, that's predominantly what you see it for. A lot of these products are what's called self-sealing. What is that? Means that they feel like they sand well enough that you can use the product as the first coat and move on through, using the same product from beginning to end. Now, then we get into, in the solvent bases, we have what's called we talked about this a little bit. Post-catalyzed, meaning you're adding a catalyst to it before you spray it. But you have very short pot lives, meaning you don't, if you, if you put the catalyst, it's just like an epoxy, you put the catalyst in that, you've got a window of time you have to use it. After that, it's going to get hard as a rock. And for whatever you do, don't leave it in your gun because it's going to set up. It's a chemical reaction. It's not drying. And we've talked some about evaporative finishes and reactive. Evaporative is like shellac. Shellac is evaporative. When the alcohol, you know, when you put it on and the alcohol evaporates out, you now have a film. Lacquers are the same. But we have a stuff called nitrocellulose lacquer. It's one of, depth is a nitrocellulose. If you look at the, then you're going to see the cans that say pre-cat. And then you're going to see the cans that say must, you know, here's one right here. This has to be catalyzed. And it's a primer. Um, is wood bar, here's wood bar. You'll notice on underneath the label it says here that you have to add a catalyst to it. If it says you have to add a catalyst, you have to. If you don't, it's never going to dry. Reactive finishes, post catalyzed finishes. When you see the term pre cat, that means it already has a catalyst in it. It's slower acting. We talked about that. Some were used these, depending upon the company, they're going to be anywhere from four, six to 12 days before they actually convert, before that catalyst actually catalyzes it. It's just a slower acting so that it can be packaged and you don't have to do anything else to it. Then, like I said, we have the post catalyzed stuff that you do it and, and it, it's going to set up and get harder quicker. Then we get into the water bases. Now, a lot of the water bases, you're going to see all kinds of stuff. Like I told you, 
Here's an extender. Some manufacturers make it, some don't. What does extenders do? Slows the dry. Here's a crosslinker. What is that? Well, crosslinker is a fancy word for a, a, basically a catalyst in water base. Water base and solvent base are as different as day and night. Solvent bases use lacquer resins and all kind of stuff. The difference with solvent and water, the major difference, solvent is able to dissolve the resin, to melt it. Just like putting alcohol in shellac and it dissolves the resin, converts it to a liquid, allows you to put it on, the solvent leaves it, and it leaves a film. That's exactly what solvent bases do. By adding the catalyst to it, we're able to cure it, harden it, enhance the resins, make them tougher, all of that good stuff. Water base is, a, is where the, 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 the mole, uh, we've talked about this, where the molecules of finish are held basically in suspension. And what happens is when they go down, they have to come together and glue together. Now that's the same reason, those two differences, is the very reason that solvent-based products can be thinned just as thin as you want. Water base cannot. Like I've told you, if you thin that water base, you separate those molecules and you're going to get globby, it's awful. Water-based products also have more surface tension. We talked about that a little bit. Solvents have virtually none. They'll lay out nice and smooth right off the gun. Water bases don't do that. We're going to look at that when we spray, and that's one of the reasons we're hitting this now. Crosslinkers added to water base, we talked about them molecules gluing. What the crosslinkers do is they actually, it's kind of like a difference in it being glued together and being welded together. It creates a much stronger, tighter bond, and again, helps to reinforce the, fin the film molecules. Cross-linked finishes, post-catalyzed finishes, are the toughest, bar none. Okay, now, so when we get into water base, that's where we see a different group of resins showing up. We're going to see the acrylics, phenolics, urethanes. And, and we've got alkalis and all of this stuff. These are kind of the basics. An acrylic is very hard and non-yellowing. A phenolic is hard and brittle and is temp typically used for exterior. Now, if they add an alkali to this, then they get a balance and it makes a good finish. Urethanes are usually man-made resins and they're made to be tough and flexible. Now, why is all of that important? Urethane and polyurethane, while there is somewhat of a difference, just think about them kind of as the same thing. An acrylic is going to dry hard. A polyurethane or urethane is going to dry tough and more flexible. Now, whether you're brushing a finish or spraying a finish, unless you have an environment and you're proficient enough to put a finish on that's satisfactory off the gun, meaning you can spray it when you're done, you're done. You don't have to rub it or do anything then it doesn't matter. But if you have to rub it out 
These are some things that are important. And here's why. Lacquers and shellacs both dry hard and hard finishes are easy to rub out. Water-based acrylics, remember the acrylic, hard, easy to rub out, easier. Oil varnish polyurethanes, much tougher, much tougher. Well, some of the toughest are the spar varnishes. The reason is, is that they're pliable, they're elastic to a point. And, you know, it's like trying to rub out a piece of rubber. I think Bob Flexner in his book compared it to an automobile tire to a windshield. Real good comparison. And Bob has a good book out there. Some other good books, Jeff Jewett, um, Michael Dresner, I like him a lot. And uh, Terry Machini, Machini, I can't say her name. She's got a new one out. T to have these books to give you references and to be able to see different people's takes and see the, all the nice charts and everything that are right there at your fingertips, it's a really good thing to have, okay? Because there's no one person, and no, you know, whether we do it here in a moving picture and they're doing it in a written form, it's the combination of all of that that gives you the full, concise understanding because they can break these down further. All right. Then we get into compatibility issues. If you'll look right here, this says sand and sealer. And forget the name on the label. It, you know, it, it depends on what manufacturer you're using. Okay, and here's a sanding sealer. This one says a pre-cat. Now here we have a pre-cat top coat. And if we read on the top of it, it's telling us that we need to use a pre-catalyzed sealer underneath the pre-catalyzed. And that's true. If you can't just go out here and start slopping all kind of different stuff on there. There's a lot of different factors involved. So you, again, I'm gonna reiterate this. Whatever manufacturer you're using, you stick with a system and learn that system because that's where it's compatible, especially in water, in water bases. The chemistry varies a lot from manufacturer to manufacturer. Water, in a solvent base, it's not so much, but you definitely can't take one guy's catalyst and use it in another guy's finish not going to work just not going to happen the other thing if you're using catalyzed finishes and you're using shellac be real careful and make sure you've got it you're compatible because shellac being a resin we're putting a hard chemically cured product on top of it i've never had an issue but i'm not going to tell you one couldn't occur so you be careful now particularly in solvent base there's also a thing that's called a recoat window. What am I talking about? Well, you know, you put a coat on today and then you decide to let it dry two or three days, you better be careful. Because there's a point that this finish starts to set up or it's dried to a point that the next coat on top of it is gonna try to soften it to melt in and, and bond, and it can and it can't. Because this finish is right at a critical point. It's neither wet nor is it cured. So what happens is that finish, it can cause it to wrinkle or lift. Excessive films can cause it to lift and to create you problems. Now, I've not seen it too much in water base, but there's a term called cold checking. What is cold checking? Cold checking is where you just keep going and just get 
piles of finish on there. That doesn't work, guys. And a little later, we're going to be talking about mill thickness. That's the way the thickness of a film is measured and how much you want. Again, I'm going to say it one more time. You make sure that your compatibility with everything and try your best to stay within the confines of one manufacturer. Now that doesn't, you know, when you get into your stains and dyes, you really don't have a lot of issues. Stains are kind of stains and dyes are kind of dyes. They're not going to create you issues unless you try to put a water base over an oil base. And even though there's a lot, I said this and say it again, even though there's a lot of stuff out there that says you can, and you can, but you got to be positive that that oil is totally dry and cured. And that's almost impossible to do. If you want to take the chance, go for it. The best advice I can give you is to put down a barrier coat of shellac. Remember, you can put oil over water, like if you've got an oil-based stain, you want to put an oil-based, I mean a water-based stain, you want to put an oil-based top coat, you're fine. It's going the other way. Now we're going to talk about sheens. The professional, pretty much all of the professional guys, while they will tell you something is a satin, a semi-gloss, gloss, whatever, Here's the, their scale is based on zero to a hundred. Higher the number, more gloss. Typically, like an 80 up is a gloss sheen, 50, 65, semi, 35, satin, 15 dull. So if you see the product and it says it's a 35 degree sheen, you know it's a satin. Most of them nowadays will call it a satin. And satin is probably the most dominant sheen out there. Because it lays down, it has a nice look, it's not a super, super high gloss. Fingerprints and whatever don't show on it and it gives a soft, mellow look. So a satin to a semi-gloss is usually the most commonly used in, in working with furniture. Now, with that said, if you buy a can, like a, in the shellac, we were talking about, you shake the can or you buy a can, a spray can of gloss, or you get a gallon and there's nothing in the bottom of it, it's not supposed to be. That's why they don't put the little rattle ball in the gloss. Don't need it. When you get down to the other sheens, the way they do that is they use a stuff called fume silica. What it does is it diffuses light, simply put. You know, you've seen the, the autom automobiles, the cars and trucks and whatever, and you see the metallic in it, the little flakes of metal that are in there to give it the pretty little look. Kind of the same thing, except this dulls it. All these products start out as a gloss. And what they do is, and, and it will settle, you're going to see in the bottom Something looks like this. That's the fume silica. And it's used in everything. You can even buy it to add to shellac, which is typically always a gloss. You'll see it referred to as flattening paste, all kind of stuff. Now, what it does is it's, again, you gotta mix it up good, because it's, and keep it mixed while you're finishing, because it's what's gonna diffuse the light and give you the satin look. Now, when we did the oil finishes things, one of the things we talked about was that to use a gloss and then your last coat to use a satin, if that's what you want. You know, it does help, and it helps particularly in the oils. In the lacquers, and the reason is, is that the more sat, the more we diffuse our, our light, we can kind of cloud the surface. In the lacquers and in the spray top coats, it does make a difference, but it's not immense. It's not as much as it is in the oils, okay? So, 
you know, do you need to have a gallon of gloss and a gallon of satin? No. I really don't know very, I don't know any professional finishers actually that do that. And it just doesn't make that much difference. Uh, brushing lacquers, and of course that's covered in brushing. Brushing lacquers are typically your nitrocellulose lacquers, and they've actually got a thinner added that slows the dry down. Can you spray them? Yes, you can. But they're very slow to dry. Be very careful with them because you can get runs because they're real slow drying. Durability. On the scale of on the scale of typically sprayed finishes, the night the nitrocellulose lacquers are the least durable. Moving up, your pre-cats. Then we move into our post-catalyzed products. You, you can get post-catalyzed lacquers, very, very tough. You can get conversion varnishes, even tougher yet. Okay, now, heat resistance. There's a thermoplastic and all of this stuff. Nitrocellulose lacquers are probably one of the worst for heat resistance because they'll melt. A better choice would be, you know, oils do pretty good. When we get into heavier film finishes, the pre-catalyzed, as long as you let it cure good before you put heat to it, let it get too much heat. And of course, the best is the post-catalyzed products. They are the best. But again, you don't want a real heavy film. All of these products, solvent base, all of them. You know, everybody's like, I don't want it to look like plastic. Well, I got news for you. That has to do with how much, how thick and how shiny it is. But it's all basically a plastic. It's exactly what it is, okay? And uh, that's the way they behave. That's what they are. All right, in the water bases, uh, as long as you don't get all of these resins that are, we looked at in the water bases, they're subject to be able to melt. Now here, here's a little common denominator. The, the stuff that's the most chemical resistant and whatever is going to be your pre-catalyzed. And in a home environment, a pre-catalyzed lacquer is going to do you well. I don't know many places you're going to have an issue that it's not going to handle it fine. If you were doing a solid wood countertop, you might want to look at going with a post-catalyzed uh, conversion varnish or something like that. In the water bases, uh, the pre-cats or adding the cross linker definitely gives a tougher film. All right, that's just the facts. So, but again, this is something you, again, and one more time, check with the manufacturer, the product you've got. If all the information isn't on the label, you go to them. All right, because there's so many different products out here in this video, it's just impossible to cover. We're gonna be spraying some solvent and we're gonna be spraying predominantly water base. It's the toughest. Now, old finishers like me, we love solvents because they're, they're easy to get along with, except you've got all the problems. Now, one of the things you're gonna see out there, and I've mentioned this, is that you're gonna see finishes tell you do not thin. And the reason for that is we have this VOC thing. Now, this is solvents I'm predominantly talking about. VOCs is uh, volume of organic content or how much nasties is in it, sort of. And I told you HAPS, H-A-P-S, stands for hazardous air pollutants. Now, the reason they tell you don't thin is that when you add thinner or solvent to it to reduce the viscosity, you added more VOCs. And it will exceed the level that the government says is the maximum that it can. Uh, a lot of these products have to be thinned. I don't think that the, unless you're spraying a massive amount of finish, I don't think anybody's going to come looking for you. 
But that's why it says do not thin. You can thin any solvent base. Water bases, again, it's going to depend upon the product. Every product manufacturer is going to be somewhat different. Typically, 10 to 15 percent is about the max. All right. The other thing that a lot of people have been talking about is using a tack rag. A tack rag is usually a rag that's kind of sticky and it's used to remove fine, minute dust off of a finish just prior to spraying. Now, most of your tack rags, the cheap ones, are actually cheesecloth that are saturated with a varnish and or linseed oil. They're sticky, gooey. And when you wipe it, they pick up the dust on it. Now, the problem with water bases is those tack rags can leave a minor little oil finish on there. And it creates an adhesion problem. So everybody says, don't use a tack rag. Now, we buy these at the Auto Body Supply Store. They're a little bit pricey, but these are a little different animal, okay? And they do an, a super nice job. But if you'll notice on it, it says that it is made for waterborns. And I use them. But again, now solvent-based, little sticky ones, don't have a problem because whatever gets on there, the solvent's just going to dissolve and melt it right in. Now with all of that said, solvent base is the, is where, is, is been around forever. Like I've told you, it's a very mature finish. Now I'm going to spray this panel with a pre-cat lacquer. Now, the thing I want you to pay attention to when I do that is that when I come over here with my gun, you're going to see me start, release my trigger, come back, come down, and keep going. What I want you to focus on is how wet I lay the finish on with each pass. Now, when we get into spraying some of the vertical stuff, I'm going to explain to you a little bit more about what's called a tack coat. Some call it a compatibility coat. On this one, we're okay. All right, it's, we're good. But I'll explain that to you in a little bit. But what we're going to do is spray this, let it dry, see how well it flows out, levels out, and then we're going to compare it to our water base finishes. And what I wanted you to see here is when we're done is watch the technique. The other thing is, is when I'm done spraying is to focus on the surface texture of a solid, of a solvent based lacquer so that we can compare that to our water base because they're very much different. All right, can you see a little fuzzy area here? Looks fuzzy. That's called dry spray. I don't know if I can help you see this or not. Billy, you're going to have to give me a nod. That's called a dry spray. And I've either got a little bit of a dirty tip or I'm off a little bit on my overlap. So I'm in a panic. What do I do to get that taken care of? Watch.
what I was after is I want to see this thing kind of wet. I want to see some gloss on it. I want to see it. I want to see this some gloss on it. Right now I want to see just a little bit of orange peel. You know, and it's exactly what it implies. It looks just a little bit like the peel of an orange. Because this is going to flow out and level out. Can we see that, Billy? All right, we're going to let this dry. We'll go come back and look at it. All right, first coat on this is dried down. Now, right in here, I've got some really rough looking orange peel. And actually what that is, that's just where we didn't get some of the old finish that's been put on this sample board off. But if this was a piece of just regular, my first coat, I would let it dry down. Now again, I don't have a lot here to sand. And that's not what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm taking a sponge. This is a 320-400. And I'm just lightly wiping over to remove any specks of dust or dirt or anything like that. Just kind of level them down. This is just called a, a light stuff. Again, very, very minor. If I didn't have a sponge, I would take something like a, a uh, just a white, it's a sterate sandpaper. Okay, what's a sterate? It's actually coated with a lubricant. Now, there's a whole lot of issue out here about not using this with water base. I've talked to every water base company I know of. Nobody agrees with that. Here's where there is an issue, because they're saying that the, um, the steroid on this, will, which is a lubricant, will come off on a, and create adhesion problems. If that's the case, I wholeheartedly suggest you change sandpapers. Good sandpaper manufacturers, people like Merca, people like uh, Norton, people like Klingspor, 3M, when you buy good name brand sandpapers, they can't have those kind of issues. But when you, and there's a lot of this import stuff coming in that's sold for a little bit of nothing. I've already told you back in the sanding thing, and just to remind you, number one, the quality, the standard by which they make it is pretty much out the window. They're gluing sand on paper. And you know, you've got all kind of variations in grits and this and that. It's not made to any decent standard. And if you buy good quality sandpaper, I've never seen the Steri give an issue. So a lot of these guys out on the forums are saying to use the silicon carbide, which is the black stuff. Problem with that is it loads up because you're sanding something that's not totally hard at the moment. It loads up and just you know, you, you just waste a lot of sandpaper. Again, I've never had an issue. If you worry that you will, you could actually just take and wipe it down with some damp, a damp cloth or something of that nature. Um, but I've never had an issue and I don't know of anybody who has. So anyway, I could also take some of this. That's what it's made for, mid-coat sanding is what it's called. And I could sand it off. Now you notice when I'm sanding, I'm getting a white dust is coming up. When it's powdering, is what it's called, you know it's dry enough to sand. Okay, again, always having a little test panel that you're, everything, you have a test panel. Now I could take a compressed air, I could take a regular cloth, vacuum, whatever. I want to make sure my environment is clean. Once I'm clean, then I use my tack cloth. Now, see what I'm doing? I'm only pulling that trigger a little bit. I'm just getting the air. If I had a turbine that was a, uh, a non-bleeder or a bleeder, it would be blowing air and I could just use it to blow it off. All right. Always get these out of the way. You get finished on your tack rag or on your sandpaper, you just trashed it. Always keep your tack rags in a nice tight container, otherwise they, they dry out. I want to show you this. 
This is dried down nice and level, even though I've got the orange peel here. Like I said, that's from, we used to have these standing up, so from here down it kind of got nasty. But you can see all the sand scratches and everything from the where we sanded it because it has dried and shrunk down. Finishes shrink. That's where the solvent has left. That is what is referred to as a full wet coat. If I was putting that on a vertical surface, I probably wouldn't put it on quite that wet. Again, you can look at it, you see the gloss, you see the shimmer to it, and, you, and I'm hoping, Billy, can you get the texture on this? Now that's what that, this is a solvent right off of the gun. What we're going to look at now is I'm going to show you, we was talking about these needles, nozzles, and air caps. Now what I've got is I've got the Erlex 5000, that's the two-stage. And I've got two identical guns. I've got the Target Ultima water base locker, they call it. It's really not a locker, but anyway. What I've got is I've got my fluid needles set, same position. On this gun, I've got a number one nozzle, or needle nozzle. And in this gun, I've got a two. And we're gonna take a look at that, the differences, and see what the difference is. I'll start with the two. Now what I want you to watch is the surface texture, the amount of fluid in the surface texture. Now, this is a 2, this is a 1.5, or 1.0. Now, as this lays here and flows out and I'm looking at it, this, really, I don't know if, there you go. I've got way too much fluid coming out on that number 2. This ain't bad. If all I had was a number two, is there anything I can do? Because this right here, if this was vertical, it would just be running in the floor. Spraying also involves how fast you move. Now what I did here was moved about as fast as you normally would. Now spraying this, trying to have to move that fast is really not impractical. So what is it we would do? Let's turn this over. Don't do that. All right. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to this number two gun. But this time, 
I'm going to reduce the fluid. Remember this little doohickey? Now it's a Duma flopper. That's your fluid needle. I'm going to take it in so I reduce the fluid. A little bit too far. I'm going to look at it. One of the things that we found was with the target coatings, the Ultima, the viscosity of it was thinner than most. Very close, very, very close to a solvent based lacquer. But y'all can't do this. <laughs> All right, Gemini Titanium, Pure, ML Campbell's Aguilante, General Finishes Enduro. Here's what I'm showing you. Now I done told you all your water bases are gonna look white, they dry clear. The target is the thinnest. These are like a cream, a heavy cream. This one, it too is like a heavy cream. Let me see if I can show you this as it comes off the... This is about like milk. Now we're talking about viscosity here because viscosity is going to translate into atomization. That's the breaking it up. Yeah, that's like a, somewhere between a whole milk and a heavy cream. That's like a heavy cream. That's like a, about the same as the Enduro. And this is about like, heavy cream. All right, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the, this thing between, between the general, I mean the uh, Gemini and the uh, Aguilante from ML Campbell seems to be the heaviest viscosity. So I'm going to jump up here to the uh, Gemini and I'm going to give it, and I'm going to put that in the guns and we're going to come back and see if that makes what difference that makes. All right, you can see how slow that's coming out into the gun. Anyway, now this is the Gemini's titanium. You can also see how this is drying down. Now the other thing we're we're kind of looking at here and there's a lot of hype out here about the two stages won't spray water-based paint or water-based finishes. Now common sense says if the, if the two stage will do it, the three and the four will definitely do it. And the content is, is that it's not enough air pressure to atomize it. And that's where what I'm telling you is, is that you could back down a size of needle Again, it's like that finger over that water hose and it's a combination of pushing that fluid through a smaller orifice with the air, you can get the atomization. That's what we're going to look at. This is the thickest I know of out there. Take that back. Uh, Fuhrer has one, it's called a 380. And we never did, it was, we we couldn't get it through a turbine.
period. That's just, you know, that's just the facts. It's a real heavy, it's a commercial based product. And uh, the only thing we got to spray it was the, uh, was the compressed air guns, the gravity feds uh, with a large nozzle and a lot of pressure. And it's predominantly designed for the air assisted airless and that kind of stuff. But these are the guys you're kind of going to see out there. Target, Gemini, ML Campbell, uh, General Finishes, and then uh, the Fuhrer. Billy's fussing at me because this respirator messing up my dude, guys. Hey. Yeah. So it'll look like a Muppet. It'll get worse before it gets better. All right, what I got over here, y'all supposed to be watching this, not me anyway. What I got is I got the 2.0 needle nozzles. Some gun companies call them atomization kits or atomizing kits. And I haven't changed the fluid setting at all. Now we've got a very heavy viscosity water-based finish in a two-stage turbine. Let's take a look. I'm getting a breakup, but I'm not getting any fluid. So I'm going to back up. Give me some more fluid. All right, now I could have probably reduced my fluid here, but out here, even on that heavy, this is where that 1.0 gave me a little bit better breakup, just a little bit. All right. Now, both of these, as I'm looking across it, this is much more orange peely than this. That means I broke it up a little finer. Also, with the one, I didn't lay down as much uh, material. Now, there's another thing out here, all kind of calculations you can use, and that's called wet mill thickness. What is that? That's where you don't, typically you don't want to exceed about four mils in thickness. Mill is a, is a measurement that's referred to in film thickness. Now you wouldn't want to do this to a finished piece, so that again having that scrap. This is called a wet mill gauge. 
All right, see this? And the way this works is that when you touch it down, it's, let me set it on here. At whatever point you touch is where your wet mill film thickness is. Now I'm very light. All right, I'm really not touching any of these points. So I don't have a real heavy mill thickness. Here's a general rule of thumb. So I don't even really have a full, I've maybe got a one to 1.2 mil thickness. That's wet. We don't want to exceed four dry. A full wet coat. Here's a general rule of thumb that I use. Now again, you do not want to pile a ton of finish on. My general rule of thumb is I want approximately four coats. If I use a sanding sealer, I'm typically going to count it as one coat. If I can get the look and the sheen and everything looks nice and full bodied and, I'm, and I, you know everything looks really nice at three, I'm going to stop. If I need to go four, I will. Uh, if I need, if I've got dirt and trash or run or something and I need to go to the fifth coat, I'm just going to scuff it really good. So I'm kind of cutting back to come back with a top coat. Um, try, you know, now again in solvent base, um, you, like I said, you can get that cold checking thing and all of that stuff. Not seeing it too much in water base. Now, one of the other things between water base and solvent, and some of the people look and say, well, gee, you know, water base is more expensive. Well, yes, but there's another side to that. And that has to do with solid contents. Water bases are far more, they have a lot more solids. And, you know, most of these are range in the 30, somewhere between 29 and 34% solids. What does that mean? Well, if it was 33% solids, a third of this can is resin. A third of this can is going to become your film. Everything else is going to go away. A lot of your solvent bases will run 18, 20, 22 is pretty high. They use a, a much lower solids content. That's why they have a real hard time meeting the VOC requirements. So just this has nothing to do with nothing, but it's just information. Just so you know how they do that. In solvent-based lacquers, there's a chemical, there's a, a solvent called MEK. Methyl ethyl ketone. It's in all of your lacquer thinners. And it's actually what dissolves the resins like alcohol dissolves shellac. Everything else they add to it, okay, is just thinners. Difference between a solvent and a thinner. A thinner thins. You put water in a water base, you thin it. When you put MEK into a bucket of solvents or a bucket of resins and it dissolves them, that's a solvent. The solvent is what dissolves whatever's in the bucket. Um, example, shellac. Alcohol becomes the solvent. It dissolves it. It's also the thinner. Okay, so to meet VOCs, uh, acetone is no longer considered a HAPS or a VOC problem. It's been removed. So they just beef up the amount of acetone in it.
Whoopie diddle, I know you want to know that. But anyway, now the thing I want you to notice here is this is drying out. Right now, if you look at this, this is not nowhere close to as smooth as what our, our solvent base was. Much more orange peely looking. Much rougher looking. So I was waiting for a minute so I could show you that. But when we come back and this dries, it goes down and it levels out. It's wild to watch it. I mean, it's, and I don't sit around and watch water-based finish dry. But you can walk away from this stuff and you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh man, especially if you're used to Solomon, that's never going to work. Because it's going to look textured, real orange peely. Walk away from it, come back, let it dry, slick as glass. Same thing applies if you're brushing water bases. Okay, don't overbrush them. Let them flow out. Remember, this is drying by all those little molecules coming together and gluing. That's all right. And we're actually laying down solids that are sus suspended in a solution. A little different than that, but to understand it. In the case of solvents, we're laying down something already dissolved. It's all one liquid. All right, that's the reason a lot of times when you're spraying a water base and you first look at it as soon as it goes down, it almost looks like it's got a little sand grit in it some. Here's another thing with, with water base. I told you it's very, very temperature sensitive, and it is. The ideal spraying conditions for basically any finish is about a 50% relative humidity down. And about somewhere between 70 and 90 degrees. Now, here's something you can do. You can take your water base and warm it. Now don't put it in a microwave or put it in a pan or do anything stupid like that. Take it and put it in a, some hot water and just warm it. Also, try to have the piece that you're spraying warm, 70, 80 degrees, okay? And then and keep this warm, your finish warm. Works great. Tell you what else it does too. Works well in solvent base. But again, setting it in hot water, and for goodness sake, don't get solvent base anywhere around the flame. A lot of guys will tell you use a double boiler, you know, where you got a pan and you got water in it, and then you got another pot in it, and, and then you set the can of finish in that. That works, but make sure you don't do it on a gas burner or something, okay? That stuff is highly, highly flammable. Same way with the, uh, I mean, same thing with the water base. It's not flammable, but don't go getting crazy with it. That's another way to keep it warm. High humidities can cause blushing. Blushing is where the finish absorbs the moisture in the air. I say it again. I know I've already told you this. I'm just hammering it home. And in compressed air, if you have moisture in your lines, it's going to go in and contaminate your finish. Also in compressed air, you can get from the compressor, you can get oil in the line. So be very, very particular about what you do. All right, that pretty much covers the finish thing. Again, refer to your books, go out, get the MS, uh, MSDS sheets, study it, read it, know the product you're using. All right, now the last thing I want to tell you is, is just like the Aguilante, I could have thinned it a little bit if I wanted. I used it straight out of the can. Now, this is already flashed off over here where I used the number one tip. This is still pretty wet. I could have taken the number two and toned it down a little bit. Having that range of, no of needles and nozzles for various viscosities and situations really helps, okay? And in the case, I think for the example with the Erlex, it comes with about a number two I think the turbinator, I think it comes with a 
and I think most all of your gravity feds will initially come with about a 1.4 to a 1.5 okay so just check and see where they're at and if you're going to be spraying water base you can get the gun and as long as you can get it to do what you want you don't need the needles and nozzles I just want you aware they're out there and they can help you in your spraying what we're going to do in our next segment is we're going to do some vertical spraying we're going to look at ways to spray we're going to look at what we want it to look like when it goes on spraying uh, horizontal is easy that's real easy. That vertical thing and all them nooks and getting around and in and out and what, you know, that's the hard stuff. That's what we're going to look at. We're going to take a look at some different scenarios and we're going to start out spraying vertical. And what we got here is an inside corner. Now, what I'm going to use, I'm actually using Aguilante, that's an ML Campbell water base, and I'm using my Turbinator. Now, because I'm going to be spraying, I definitely do not want my turbine this close because as I come in here, that spray is going to be coming past it and I'd be hitting my filters and, you know, that's the reason we want this thing as far away from where we're, you know, as, as practical. So it gets plenty of good fresh air. So we're going to get it out of the way. That's still not quite as far as I'd like it by no means, but it'll do. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I want to check my spray pattern. Now this is, uh, in this gun I've got a 1.5 needle and nozzle. Now what I'm looking for is my speed and how much fluid I'm getting. Alright, that's going to depend upon how much, if I've got a lot of fluid, then i got to move faster. Turn my fluid down, go a little slower. Again, practice, practice, practice. Now the other thing we're going to talk about is a, we call them a tight coat. If this was a piece of, this happened, like I said, these got a ton of finish on them. But if this was my first coat on a piece of wood, when that finish first, first hits it, everything's kind of got to work itself in together. You know, you got to get that finish to bond into the wood and all that good stuff. And a lot of times it doesn't like to do that right off the bat. And so if we put a full wet coat on it, well, we're going to get some runs. So we're going to look at the first pass, we're going to put a tack coat and we'll look and see what that is.
All right, all it is is kind of a medium wet coat so that I don't have a risk of runs. Now you notice I've got the fan turned horizontal. Could I spray this spraying vertical? Yes, I can. But I better be a good shot. Because when I come over to this corner, there's going to be a pause whether I want it to be or not. And so it's knowing where to, you got to let that trigger go just right or you're going to get a buildup in the corner. They're just made for runs. Inside corners coming this way, same thing. Now, I want to talk just a minute about overspray. Overspray is the stuff you see coming out. And in an inside situation, you get what's called bounce back. Meaning that instead of that overspray being able to go out, it's actually confined in here. Just like brushing, you want to keep a wet edge. You want to come right up. You don't want to, if this was a big long panel, I wouldn't want to spray all the way down. I would want to spray a ways, come back, pick this up, come this way, keep, keep the next, next time you spray, the next pass, always going over wet material. That's what helps them blend in and, and fold in together. If you don't, that overspray coming over here is going to create you a foggy dry spray is what it's called. It's where the, there's not enough material there to flow together and it's not going to melt in. Now the other thing we want to think about, just like here in our spray booth, behind me there's a thing called an air exchange and that pumps air into the room filtered air into the room from the over, from upstairs. On this end we have an exhaust fan. If I were spraying here, if I had a whole bunch of doors laid down through there, and I start spraying here, that overspray is going to keep, as it's pulled toward the fan, the heavier is going to drop down on top of my doors. That's not too bad because when I put a wet coat over it, I'm going to flow it in. Now, if you're having a problem with what you may think is grit or dirt, pay close attention. If it seems to be going further down, I've ran into this time and time again, is that some of these quick drying finishes, they actually dry in the air and they lay down on the whatever it is you're spraying and the next coat does not melt them in. This is predominantly in post-catalyzed products and water bases. So that said, pay attention. Think, think about what you're doing. And think about when you're pulling that overspray out, is it going all the way out? Do you have a strong enough fan? Or is it going to be carried over and deposited on your next piece you're going to be spraying? Okay, you know, you get a whole bunch of drawers and you've got the drawer faces setting up or doors or whatever, you got a problem. All right, I want to look at this. This is starting to set. It's sticky. I don't want to let it dry completely. Now I'm going to come back and I'm going to spray it with the nozzle horizontal, I mean vertical. I normally wouldn't, but I'm going to do it just for you to see and we're going to get a wet coat on it. Now with this 1.5, I still had to tone down the fluid a little bit. And this is a four stage and I've got the pressure there wide open.
All right, I can tell you right now, we do not have enough atomization. We are not, you see, you see how knotty, orange peely that is? Can you see that okay? That's not acceptable. You can, you, you can see it. Looks marbly. Now, water base goes on kind of white, looking like I said it dry. That is not broken up enough. We'll kill the camera. I'm going to switch to a 1.0 nozzle. Now, that's kind of contrary. A 1 is a pretty fine nozzle, and I'm using a pretty high viscosity product. But let's see what it does. All right, it's just been a matter of minutes. I've got the nozzle changed. I want you to look at this. This is all but running, just before running. Now that's gonna, that'll level out a lot, but is it gonna give us a smooth surface? No. So what do you do with that? Name one thing you can do. Watch it, don't let it run. Let it dry, sand it back. What does that mean? It means you're gonna have to take some 320 and sand it back nice and smooth back up and reevaluate and at some point I will assure you four letter words will be involved. Now I've gone to a 1.0. Now that's all, like I told you, that's contradictory to what most tell you to use the big needles and nozzles for the heavy viscosity stuff. Now, and that would have normally been my take on it, but in working with this, all this water base, well, let's take a look. 1.0 nozzle. And I cut the fluid down a little bit. Now, water base is orange peely when you first put it on. That's just the way she, she is. But you're not near as globbed. It's, it's, let's kill the camera, let's give it two or three minutes, and let's see how it starts to lay down. This is a little better. It's still kind of knotty, and actually up at the top, I tested one of the other guns, so I can't blame that, but it's drying on down still not where I want it. Now, if you look over here in the corner from spraying vertical, you're going to see a white line going all the way down. Can we get that? That's just where it's trying to build in that corner. Again, that spraying these vertical with the fan going up and horizontal would have made more sense. Now we're going to do something different. We're going to look at an outside. And this is just basically panel spraying. Now I've told you before, what we want to do is we want to hold the trigger, you know, we want to hit our trigger, come past, release, drop, hit it again, come back. That takes some practice. Okay, getting that hand-eye coordination thing with your passes. Again, practice, practice, practice. Now all we got here is some plywood and we painted it. The reason we painted it well, so that we can see our patterns, our spray patterns. Cardboard works good too. Again, starting with the water and some food coloring or a little bit of dye and some water, it's just a really good place to start. But the other thing I did is I actually switched 
I switched to general finishes enduro and I switched to a 2.0 nozzle in the turbinator and remember when we sprayed the panel flat with the Erlex we went to a 2 and turned their fluid way down. It's exactly what I've done here. Then I've got my Kremlin with an HVLP gravity fed air assist we're going to look at it. Remember what we're looking at is our spray texture and breaking this water-based product up to get it on as smooth as we can. Let's take a look at it. All right, that is nice. That's what we're looking for. Wet, pretty even. I might even be a little wetter here than what I maybe should have been on the first shot. But with the Aguilante, it has a really heavy viscosity. I would have probably thinned it just a little bit with some water to help break it up just a little better. That looks good. If you look at this, I've got a light orange peel, and I'm, as I look at it, what I'm seeing is, is I'm seeing that light orange peel, but a wet, even coat. The common sense says that if this is, this is gonna shrink as it dries. So if it looks pretty good at this point, when it dries, it's gonna come on down. Now, again, practice spraying vertical takes a lot of practice. I told you before, I can't teach you how to spray. I can only teach you about it and give you pointers and things like that. The main thing I want you to understand is, is working, with your, working with your viscosities and your needles and your air pressure, speed, how fast you're moving, getting used to that trigger, okay? That's everything. But it's not hard, but it does take practice. All right, just for kicks and giggles, I've got the same Enduro in my HVLP gravity fed. Take a look at it. Finer frog's hair split four ways, as my friend Bob Close up in Wisconsin would say. When you can lay a water base out and it looks like that, believe me, when it dries, it's going to be like glass. Now, somebody's going to think that I, the problem was the Aguilante. Not. Okay? The problem was working with the different viscosities. All right? Again, Whatever manufacturer you choose, all of them are going to be different. 
okay? You know, when you buy a turbine, you might buy the Erlex, like I told you, it comes with a 2.0. I think the turbine air comes with a 1.5, I think, don't hold me to that. And, you know, most of your spray gravity feds are going to come with about a 1.4, something like that. Give it a shot. Depending upon what product you're using, again, reducing, that, or reducing the amount of fluid, your air pressure, your speed, all of that has to do with laying a film on. And that's what you're after. Again, water base will go on kind of foggy looking, white, milky looking and it will look that way. But see, in a, in a horizontal environment, all of that material is flowing out level. It's going to self-level, sort of. In a vertical environment, it's got to kind of run, but not. So that's the practice, okay? Practice horizontal. I mean, first. But then, really work hard on your verticals. Billy brought up a good point, and that is being able to look down the sides, have plenty of light where you're seeing the reflection of what you're doing. I might have got this a little too wet. I about got me a, it ain't quite a run, but it's working on it. I ain't supposed to do that, am I? Ought to make you feel better. Hmm, I can't believe I did that. But hey. It's not enough to worry about yet because I'm looking on the side and I'm seeing it leveling. How dry is this? Not very. All right. I'm going to watch it a minute. If it don't level out, when at the point it gets a little sticky, I'm going to dust a little bit more and flow it down. I might get by with that. You might too, but uh, be careful. That's one of those advanced spraying things. It's not enough for me to brush it. It's not enough for me to wipe it. It's just, I don't know. Hmm. Arr. All right, I'm going to try it. Now why am I dusting more on there if I already got a run? Keep it flowing. Kind of keep it flowing, just get it to level on down. I don't want it to get that big old knot on the end of it. If it's just that little bit, next coat I can scuff it out. All right. Runs. I told you you'd get them. All right, yeah, shut up. Billy said I did it when I slowed down to show you the technique. That's about as good an excuse I can think of, too. I got a piece of packaging tape. I ain't got any wide masking tape. I ain't never used this before, but I don't know. Anyway, the smart thing to do is don't do it. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's almost a good thing this happened because kind of... All right, I've got that off. Now I'm going to, and it's still sticky. Now I'm going to get a light coat on top of it. Just a little bit to help kind of give me something to sand and kind of help level it back in a little bit. I'm going to have to sand it back either way I go. Now again, if that was the first coat and I had a stain under it, I'd have pulled that run real easy. I might have even been tempted just to leave it 
and get another coat or two on top of it before I tried to sand it back just so I didn't cut it cut through anywhere. Oh well, <laughs> that's finishing. We showed you this thing earlier. This is a, I don't know exactly what they used it for, but it was a leg or a pedestal or something for a table. Anyway, I told you this is one that was made by a really high-end furniture maker. Now this obviously would be a candidate in our coloring to make it extremely yellow stain it, put a top coat on or a top coat on it, and either glaze it or use a toner. Remember where we mix a dye or a stain into our top coat to be able to blend it? But that's not what we're doing. We're looking at spray. Now this one presents a little bit of a challenge. If we spray it dead on, we're not going to get under here. We're not going to get very good under here. Up here wouldn't be too bad. And if this was on a table, what would I do? I would turn the table upside down, spray, and then try to flip the table. These are tough sheets. But let's look at it. Now I'm going to start out with my little Kremlin here, just because it's already loaded up. And I'm going to show you how I handle it. What I'm doing is reducing my, what I'm doing is reducing the uh, fluid. All right, that's the first coat. I went easy. That needs to get dried and it would of course get scuffed and then we'll be able to see it a little better. Now I realize you can't really see because it's a first coat other than sheen. But the point I wanted you to get was I went through and caught the area that my spray is not typically going to hit. This is a little shaker style table. Now, you know, these are one of the simplest things to make. But believe it or not, they're one of the hardest to spray. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is what I've got. I got me some of, now this, this is those um, upholstery thumbtacks just tapped in the leg. Make sure they're in good. Use a hammer. Don't get them in too far. Nice hammer, huh? Don't get them in too far because that thing's... But what we want is something that it's not going to be sitting down on the paper we're spraying. Now much like what we just did on the pedestal, what I want to do is I want to get the areas that once it's vertical is going to be very difficult. Here's another thing that makes this difficult and that's getting inside of here. All right. Now that said, that's where being able to tune that thing down, we always called it in the autobot, we always called it shooting rabbits. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. And that's where we 
turn that fan down and get a, or on the turbines, we switch it to a round pattern and just kind of get back up in there the very best we can. But while it's vertical, I want to, or upside down, I want to try to get inside of here from this angle. All right, see what happens. Now what I've got is I've got probably on the inside from about this angle down and my flat parts of my drawer guides. All right, now what I want to do is I want to spray the insides and get of the legs and get this bottom. But I don't want that, I want to, I want to open that fan up. Now, I'm having to do twisting and turning and whatever. Now, what I'm going to do now is I want to flip it. Now, you see why I got the tacks. Now, here's, a, here's always a problem area, always. When you're spraying this leg, do you come up to here and stop, then come this way? Or do you come up this way and just keep coming down? Choice is yours. But what I've always found is that breaking the rhythm of the way you're moving isn't the best unless you're really, really thinking about it and, and prepared for it. So that being the case, it might not be a bad idea to shoot this Let's try it a couple ways. You pay it, you just watch and we'll look at some different things. See what we come up with.
First time you do small table, and if you've got a turn leg, treat it. Don't try to go side to side. Keep it vertical. Okay? This is, like I said, you can make you one of these out of something real inexpensive. It's a real good project to practice on because you've got all the innies and outies and lefts and rights and whatever. Now we're going to come back real quick and we're going to take a look at our last thing we're going to spray and that's that ugly raised panel door. Now I'm going to spray this and I'm going to use the turbine air and it's got still got the 2.0 in it. And I'm not spraying it so much for you to watch me spray it, but, we're, but you can. But then we're going to come back and look at sanding after the first coat. All right, we're going to let this dry and then we're going to look at, you, you notice I was having to pick at the nozzle. Just that quick, this water base was starting to set up on that nozzle. Remember me telling you about keeping the wet sponge over it? It's a good idea. All right, we're going to let this dry, come back, scuff it, get it ready for its second coat. All right. We got one coat of finish and we're going to scuff sand this. Now, in the early stages, one of my favorite little things for sanding between the coats is these little sponges. Now, and my favorite grit is 320. Now again, we don't have a whole lot of finish on here. So all I'm doing is just kind of wiping, kind of just knocking the fuzzies off. I think Bob Flexner in his book called it de-whiskering. That's a pretty good idea. Pretty good analogy. But I'm going to tell you up front. You guys, I know, you're going to get on here. Now here's another piece of 320 sterate mid-coat sanding. Now Back in the sanding one and all through, we've talked about these edges and cut through, sand throughs. Just as those runs are inevitable, so are they. Now you notice what I did. I took this sponge and I cut it so I can get in between in these little areas. Here's why. I see guys do this, and I'm going to turn this so you can see it. Here's what they do. is they get on here and they've got this piece of sandpaper and they're sanding like this. They're not paying attention. This edge is rubbing that sharp edge. And when you do that, it takes all of about that much on a sharp edge to remove your, to remove your finish and remove your color. And there you are. The other thing is, like we showed you with the runs, they're always trying to get, you know, nobody likes problems. None of us do. Can you see that? That quick. That's how long it takes. Edges in the first couple, two or three coats, let them take care of themselves. Leave them alone. That's simple. Just gently stay away from them. And if you look at this, what I'm doing in this beaded area right here, where that is, 
I'm just lightly wiping. It's all I'm doing. Just wiping it. Because I don't have anything really here to sand. Gently wiping it. That's all. Until I get it something built up. That's the way it works. What do you do when you get that? Well, we've showed you a lot. I'm going to tell you one more time. Now here's an instance where we've got a coat of finish. And particularly if you've put an oil on this, you kind of got a problem. And that is that oil is going to seal it off. Sometimes, a lot of times, so will a solvent base. Water base is usually a little bit more forgiving. And we saw this. I can take and just gently hit it. If it do still doesn't want to take my color, I can let it dry, hit it again. Or I can take some of my blending powders, mix it up, a little bit of shellac, a little brush, color it in. Kind of just take it. Still a pain. One of my favorites, and probably the most effective, I've already told you this, is get you a good set of markers. Now, again, you got to play and on your scrap determine what's going to give you your correct color. And you can take it and simply color it right on in. They work nice. The best way, again, is to avoid getting them. And the reason I'm even showing you this again, it's like that sandpaper thing. Think about what you're not thinking about. It's like the overspray drifting over. These are things through the years that have presented issues and have presented problems. Finishing, this pretty much wraps up our spray finishing and all. Again, it's practice. All we can do is give you the premise by which you can learn the art, and it is an art. Just as building is an art. And it's one of those things where the two come together to create magnificent pieces. And with any art form, you have to practice and you have to work at it. It doesn't just happen. Spray finishing, any finishing is a matter of experience. You've got to experiment a little. You've got to work with it. Pay attention to compatibilities. Pay attention to, you know, stick, get you a good manufacturer, whoever it is. You know, stick with their products. Get to know them. When you get a spray gun, you get a turbine unit. You know, it's like getting a new table saw. It's like getting a new car. It's like getting anything. You have to get used to it. You have to get a feel for it. You know, I can turn my table saw on or I can be in here and somebody out there on my saw, immediately I know if something's not right just by the sound. It's like you getting in your car and you head down the road, the sound, the feel, you know if something's not right. It's all in getting accustomed to the products and the tools that you use with them. That's what spray finishing and finishing is about. So practice, 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 and when you get done practicing, practice some more. That's the way you learn how to finish. Now, you're going to wind up having to rub finishes because in the early stages, you're not going to be able to get them perfect right off of the gun. I hope you do. If you do, please email me. I want to meet you. I certainly didn't. Took a lot of years of practice. But it's one of the nicest ways of finishing, gives you some of the best finishes. Using the good, what we'll call industrial and commercial type finishes, give you more durable finishes. 
and better colors and all of this than what you find in the home box store. Safety, again, is your dominant concern. All right, don't take your health for granted no matter what. Okay, practice.